Hello, welcome everyone to the business of freelancing. Um, I wanted to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the traditional lands of the Gwigal and Darawal people of the Eora Nation, which were never ceded. And I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands from which all of you are joining us tonight. Um, and I want to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and also to extend my respects to all the First Nations people who are present today. Now we're going to start with a short introduction from Karen Anand, who is the head of Australia for Henry. Now Henry is a, an interesting new service for freelancers. Um, it came out of New Zealand, it, it was set up about three years ago, and it helps freelancers manage their taxes and other essential finances. And uh, I, I was uh, talking to Karen earlier and uh, and I'm very sad that this came out in 2017. I think this is something I could have used when I was first freelancing and certainly possibly something I'll consider using today. So it sounds really interesting. When you're ready, Karen, it'll be good to hear from you. Thanks, Fran, for that uh, kind introduction. I, I don't think there's any higher praise than you yourself saying you wish you had it earlier. Um, but I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Gadigal people of the Euro Nation, which is where I'm currently seated, and pay respects to their elders, both past and present. Um, so Henry's really excited to be supporting the work of the Walkley Foundation and this event in particular, because we know how taxing pun intended, a financial administration can be for freelancers who are trying to connect their income with their passion. And Henry is a service that seeks to alleviate this financial admin burden. Um, and we're a service, in fact, which um, founded by freelancers for freelancers. Um, and our founders, James and Claire, who made the transition from salaried employment to self-employment, um, really struggled with working out how much tax to provision, when things needed to be filed, what needed to be paid to who, by when, um, and just generally how they should manage their financial uh, health and well-being. And so born out of this fr frustration, they developed a simple yet revolutionary proposition called Henry. And the Henry services basically think about it as tax and financial administration for freelancers in a box. So by signing up to Henry, you get three things. The first thing is, a Henry bank account where all your freelance income is paid into. And we use this account to calculate, deduct and pay the right amount of tax to the ATO, which includes your Medicare levy, any student loans and GST. And then we pay the balance, the post-tax amount to your personal bank account. And that all happens in, in the course of a matter of minutes whenever you receive an in, a, a payment into the Henry account. The second thing is the Henry app, which allows you to create quotes, invoices, log your expenses and access any personal financial reports you need. And then finally, access to the Henry team. You can talk to us whenever you like around your tax affairs. Um, and we represent you to the ATO as well. But perhaps the most valuable thing we provide in that context is we are your registered tax agents. And unlike other accounting software, we actually lodge your returns on your behalf. That's VAS returns and your income tax returns as well. And we do this via a really simple commercial model that emphasizes only getting paid when you get paid. So there's no subscription fee or additional sign up free or an account keeping fee. We take a 1% commission out of every payment that comes into the, um, the Henry app and that's tax deductible itself as well. So to celebrate our partnership with the Walkley Foundation, we're excited to offer a promo code to all the attendees of this event. Simply go to our website, which is listed on the slide in front of you, uh, henry.com.au, and sign up with a promo code Walkley, and we'll add $50 credit to your account to get you started. Um, I'm really looking forward to an insightful discussion this evening, but if you'd like to ask any further questions, um, I'll stay on the line, or feel free to use the email address, um, karen at henry.com.au, if you'd like to contact me. And that's it from me, Fran. Thanks. Back to you. Oh, thanks so much, Karen. That looks um, that looks really excellent. Um, yes. So, I, as I said, I would really uh, would really have loved to do that. I, I certainly got myself into trouble a few times. And look, it's still it's still a challenge to kind of work out, because especially if you go from salary um, to um, uh, to just receiving random um, amounts of money. I don't think I'm clicking my video properly. There we go. <laughs> Back to hopefully you can see me now. Um, so I wanted to now start. Thank you so much, Karen, and, and introduce um, the people who are joining us tonight. Um, I'll start with Kadri Vaughan. She is a tax partner at Price Coopers in Sydney. 
um, and she specialises in advising private businesses and working with a broad spectrum of clients from individuals to large privately owned companies. And she's got particular interest in advising entrepreneurs and has worked with a number of startup companies in a variety of industries. Um, Kadri is also a chartered accountant and lawyer and holds a Master of Applied Commerce and a Juris Doctor. And originally from Melbourne, um, and she's moved to Sydney almost four years ago to enjoy the better weather and worse lockdowns, um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Um, and so, so welcome, Kadri, and we're looking forward to hearing more from you. Um, you. We're also joined by Nina Fennell, um, who has been a freelance journalist since 2007. Um, she's been published in many outlets, including the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age, The ABC, The Guardian, The Washington Post, Al Jazeera, New Matilda, the list goes on and on and on, news.com.au and many others. Now, Nina is uh, the architect um, of the Let Her Speak campaign to amend sexual assault victim gag laws um, and has changed laws or is in the process of changing laws across three different jurisdictions in Australia and also organising legal support for now 18 survivors, including um, her best known um, uh, support person, um, Grace Tame, the Australian of the Year. Anina has won a host of awards for her work, including the 2020 Walkley Award for Public Service Journalism, the Walkley Our Watch Award, the 2019 Women in Media Journalist of the Year, UN Media Australia Award, Australian Human Rights Commission Award. Unfortunately, we've got only an hour and a half, so I can't list them all, but, uh, but Nina's um, very well known for her extraordinary journalism work. But I discovered for all her success, <laughs> and Nina and I had a, a bit of a confession earlier, and uh, I, I've described myself as a bit of a business bozo, um, and uh, and Nina is a self-confessed business bungler. So she she told me that she learned lots of her freelance business skills the hard way. So she's very generously agreed to share some of her mistakes and life lessons tonight, along with some very important strategies on self-care for the self-employed. Um, and that's something that I think if for anyone who's moving from an employment situation into a self-employment situation, you really start to uh, miss out on a whole lot of the supports in, in workplaces, even terrible workplaces, um, you know, uh, uh, ranging from leave and sick leave and, and uh, lots of other things that you get uh, as an employee that just disappears when you're working for yourself. Um, also joining us tonight is uh, John Myers. Hi, John. Welcome. He is the Executive Manager for Growth at Media Super, um, which is our industry superannuation fund for people working in the print, media, entertainment and art sectors. Um, so if you don't already know, I think most people do, but industry funds are run only to benefit members on a not-for-profit model. Um, and, and Media Super is... is often seen around the journalism traps, supporting various professional development and financial literacy programs. It also sponsors many industry awards um, and is also a, a sponsor of this event. So, so thanks, Media Super. Um, John's been with Media Super for 15 years and during that time he's had a lot to do with freelancers in our industry. Um, okay, so, so welcome to all our speakers. Um, and I just, just to let you give you a bit of context, this is part of a series of events from the Walkley Foundation. And we've called this one the business of freelancing because there's so many journalists, photographers and other media workers now who are freelance. In fact, in the media section, section of the um, MEAA, the Media Alliance, um, the largest single category of our members in media are freelance. Um, so it's, it's, I mean, for, for many freelancers, the gig economy is not a new thing. Um, like photographers, actors and musicians, a lot of freelancers have been gigging their whole um, working lives. But the media landscape has shifted hugely in the past 10 years. There's been well over 3,000 journalists made redundant between 2012 and 2018 and a whole bunch more. Um, and some of us, some of the people joining us tonight may be from um, community um, newspapers, which have just been decimated in, in recent takeovers. Um, so freelance is, is far more common. Um, and so we're hoping that this, uh, this event is, is going to um, help some people um, who've, who've joined freelancing um, recently and, and possibly some people who've been freelancers for a long, long time um, to, to um, improve the way that they run their freelance business. Um, so for, to that end, we're going to start with our, uh, our business guru, Kadri. Welcome. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, 
to, to getting some information from you. So freelance journalism at, um, and freelance media work, you know, for top, we've got, I'm sure we've got photographers on the line here and, and others. Um, what are the critical things that you should think about when you're setting up um, your business as a freelancer? Absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. Lovely to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity to have a chat to you. Um, the key concepts before we get into all the really exciting tax stuff, I think, is to think about simple is often the best option. I find a lot when you talk to someone and they've talked to someone and they've got this fantastic, cool structure that's going to solve everyone's problems and we've got companies and trusts and all this stuff. A lot of time, there's really not a lot of value in setting up lots of things and, you know, a simple structure, just you doing your business might actually work best. And we can talk about some of the differences between kind of having a company versus just being a sole trader. That's one. And the second critical point that I advise everyone is to make sure you really separate your business stuff from your personal stuff. Because that's where everything comes unstuck sometimes when you forget whose pocket things are coming out of. So really important to make sure that you know what your business expenses are, your personal expenses are, and you're really, really clear in terms of record keeping. And that's where, you know, things like Henry and other services can really help in terms of streamlining all that. Um, what would I tell people to think about? Well, the first thing is, are you just going to set up with an ABN by yourself and be a sole trader? Which is where we see most photographers, journalists, et cetera, start. Or whether there's value to setting up a company and, and perhaps using that structure. I do um, very, very rarely hear of people setting up partnerships and trusts and things. But what we normally would see is either individuals, or corporates. There's this wonderful half truth about companies being a fantastic liability protection. And you know, obviously limited liability is a concept and companies absolutely do have that. But what we see in practice is that if somebody is really upset with something, they will tend to sue everyone, companies, individuals, and everyone all around. So, you know, in theory, yes, there's great limited liability. They're having a corporate and there is some truth to that. But it's really a question of cost benefit if you think, you know, it's going to essentially solve all your liability problems. Insurance is a much better option than a, than a company for liability protection, in my view. Um, in terms of kind of tax rates, you've got to think about, well, companies can potentially get 30% or 26% tax rates, whereas individuals sometimes pay higher rates, depending on how much you're getting. But there's the administration of having a, having a corporate structure as well, which can sometimes be a little bit more unwieldy. Because if you're going to be an employee of your own company, you're essentially taking on all the responsibilities of being an employer, which doesn't change just because you're employed by your own company, but a worry about workers' compensation and superannuation and POIG withholding and salary and wages and all the compliance that comes along with that, which perhaps is not really worthwhile to try and get a lower tax rate in the, in the short term. The things that we um, also need to think about is making sure that you're keeping a good reason for any structure that you've set up. The ATOs always have this view that if people try to get a lower tax rate for personal exertion income, so essentially for doing something that is from your skill and your ability and your experience and your knowledge, that that should broadly be taxed to that person. So there's always a, a line between, is this income for your personal services that you've done something from your personal exertion which should be taxed to you at the higher rate? Or is it something that your business structure has earned which perhaps could be taxed at a lower corporate tax rate. And so that's one of the kind of tricky areas to think about when you're doing things like photography and, and, and journalism and more of the creative arts, that what are you actually being paid for? And are you being paid for your hours or are you being paid for the article or are you being paid for being there and doing something and, and you know what, what the contract actually says? So it's really, really key to make sure that you're very clear on what you're being paid for and why you're being paid and how you're being paid. And are you being paid for the end result or are you being paid for your time to deliver the end result and how does that work so get, get a get a you know get henry get a good tax agent get anyone call me call anyone have a good chat at the start it's much harder to unwind things than it is to kind of get your basics right at the start so absolutely worth investing some time up front to really get your foundation kind of set up and if it's as simple as i'm going to set up an abn under my own name and i'm going to be really careful and have great records and do everything in my own name that works really, really well most of the time. And there's no real necessity to set up all these structures unless you really think that there is, you know, your particular instance requires that extra little bit of structure around it. Okay. Um, What's the cost of setting up? So you're talking about lots of different structures and obviously there's gonna be a time cost. And one of the things with freelance is you don't get paid for your administration. But what, yeah. How much would it cost to set up a small company? So if I thought, okay, I'm gonna go the company route just in case I turn into some kind of 
large subcontract subcontracting sort of body. What but what's the annual cost on average? So that's a very good point in terms of if you do want to employ people, etc. You know, absolutely, um, you, you would need to set up a company structure most times. It's very, very quick and easy in Australia, and it's relatively inexpensive, thankfully. Some countries it's six months and fifty thousand dollars. In Australia, it's a few hundred dollars and it's a day. So we're very, very fortunate that ASIC has a wonderful system. It's all online. It's very, very quick, and there's lots of great corporate secretarial outfits that can do that for you. So it's certainly not a cost burden in terms of setting it up. The things that are a little bit more cumbersome is making sure you've got your annual declarations and all that kind of stuff in place to make sure you don't fall behind on anything. But if you've got anything that is a service to help you, a corporate secretarial, a Henry type person, an accountant, making sure you've got someone kind of ticking all your boxes for you would be would be my, my best advice. And making sure that you've got someone who kind of works in the industry who knows, you know, who knows what, what the particular issues are that are relevant would be really handy. Um, GST is the other one just to think about as well. So mm. as soon as you tick over $75,000 of freelance income in a year, you need to register for GST. We can um, talk about personal services income a little bit more <laughs> as well as the <laughs> message pop up because that is, oh my gosh, I agree it is one of the most confusing concepts in, in the tax law. So we can have a bit more of a chat about that. But GST is mandatory. So there's the, the bazes and things like that that need to be dealt with as well. And again, relevant whether you're an individual or a company, but there is a little bit more administration. So it is great to use whatever service there is um, to really kind of streamline those things. The, the other thing is thinking about um, making your payments in a timely way and setting up some kind of accounting system. So it is really important that you're record keeping from day one. It's so hard to go back after six months and go, oh, where did I earn this money and what happened? And like we've seen so many clients in that in that boat that just had completely forgotten where the money came from, why it's in their account, what happened. So please, as annoying as it is, timely, contemporaneous filing and documentation is really key. And once you've done all that, it really is very easy to do all the um, early, like the year end stuff if you've been really organized through the year. It's not as an insurmountable obstacle if you've been keeping your records through the year. Um, those are the main things. I think the first um, thing I would suggest is just have a chat to, to you know, an accountant or someone who's in this area and just think about whether there's any value to a company structure or a partnership or a trust or anything like that. But really, most times, a sole trader works really well. So keep it simple is, is, is great advice. Um, that whole doing it as you go, oh, God, there's been years when I've, I, I just can hear that familiar <laughs> thinking of years where I've got to the end of the year and gone, Oh no, what, what happened? <laughs> you are um, not the only one, I can tell you that. <laughs> I'm a bit better as I'm getting more experience, but God, it's yeah, it's a horrible position to be in. Um, what about GST? Now that's an interesting one because $75,000 a year, particularly when you're starting out freelancing, that just seems like an impossible goal if you're in earning um, your money only from freelance. I mean, um, so would I be better off um, not registering for GST or or thinking, okay, in year one, maybe next year I'll get to GST. What stage should you do that registration, do you think? It, it's very quick and easy to do as well. So there's no reason necessarily to jump the gun. It's not a long process. It's literally a very short form to the ATO. So I would take it slow at the start and just kind of look. There's no mandatory registration at all before 75,000. And if you do happen to tick over, you can register retrospectively. So it is not a huge issue. You can voluntarily register. So if you really see, well, I've clearly got, you know, contracts coming up, or I know I've locked in the revenue for next year, you can register the year before. It, it, it's one of those things that does bring a little bit of extra compliance. And there's obviously timing of when you need to pay your GST, et cetera. So it is, it is good to kind of be certain you're in that bucket before you necessarily jump the gun and register. And as you can, as you can register retrospectively, there's no reason to kind of preempt and worry that you've missed it and you're, there's some big penalty coming. It's absolutely not like that. You can, you can absolutely register retrospectively. It's not a problem. Okay. So, I mean, sometimes if you have been um, rather slack on your businesses, you might get towards, you know, nearly the end of the year and not realise if you've ticked over that 75,000. Do you then have to retrospectively go back and pay the GST? It's generally that you have an enterprise that's going to be over 75. And I think from memory, and I can confirm that it needs to be that that is going to be your GST turnover 
overall. So if it's only going to be a one-off thing for one year, you don't have to then essentially go back and register forever because you're not carrying an enterprise that's going to have more than 75,000 annually. So there is a little bit of leeway there because it's essentially more that that's your normal turnover is what the, what the expectation is. Okay, but it's not such a big deal if you don't get to 75, is it? So if you if you made 30, you know, 30,000 last year, 50,000 this year, and you think, oh, you never know, things might improve. <laughs> um, and, and so if you do register for GST, you can actually charge your clients and gather the, the GST. So you're not out of pocket if you register even if Correct. you don't get the 75, Correct. is that Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And okay. the, the other advantage is that if someone charges you GST, you can claim it as well. It's just that in a lot of the time, you wouldn't be having as many inputs into your business so that the claiming part doesn't practically make as much of a difference. There is mm -hmm. something as well in terms of, there is a um, kind of a legitimization of having GST as well, you know, that the people do sometimes voluntarily register for GST because it does make them look like they're a little bit more established sometimes. And I have seen that mm -hmm. in fact. So there is a little bit of a um, kind of a, a perception thing there as well, which I've seen in practice. Yeah. Okay. Oh, good. So what about, I mean, what does the ATO look at when they're looking at journalists' tax returns? What are the areas of ATO focus that we should really try and make sure we get right? Deductions, deductions, deductions. They are so hung up on work-related deductions at the moment, not just for journalists. Um, more so relevant for journalists because it'll be in, in your own businesses and that's where the ATO thinks that there might perhaps be a little bit more um, leeway taken with some things that might not be directly related to work. So um, absolutely critical is good record keeping, making sure that you've got really crystal clear records of why you're essentially going to be able to claim that, what the direct relationship is between that expense and your business. So there needs to be a bit of thinking there and there's there's a lot of difficulty with things that have a private element and the ability to claim that. So, you know, things that you might think, I bought this really nice bag to carry to my meeting. The ATO does not have the same view. They, they think a laptop may be, a briefcase may be okay, but as a general principle, things that make you look professional aren't gonna be covered or things that, you know, are particular, um, have a personal element to them are all really taken out. So there is a, a bit of difficulty with making sure you can claim everything and the record keeping aspect is really key to make sure that you've got good receipts, good substantiation about why you needed it and what it related to. Um, the other thing is personal services income. So, <laughs> which is always the bugbear of, of kind of anyone who's in the creative kind of industry or doing anything that relates to personal services. I think um, journalists in particular have really good arguments in my view, and I know everyone's got a slightly different view, but I think journalists in particular have really good arguments to say that they're being paid for a result. So if I explain what that means, so personal services income essentially says, regardless of how you contract, you've got companies, you've got trusts, you've got all sorts of structures. If it's a person behind that and the income is broadly more than 50% produced by that individual skills, labor, expertise, knowledge, exertion, that that income is attributed to that person and taxed to that person. So that's the starting proposition. So as a starting point, everything that you guys do would be personal services income because it's your exertion that's creating the income. However, that's not the end of the story, because even if it is personal services income, there's a whole bunch of carve outs that say, well, you could be carrying on a legitimate personal services business that could still be taxed as the company. You could have lots of different clients that are paying you for results. So paying you for the article, not for the exertion, paying you for the book, not for the exertion. All those kind of things are carve outs. And what really is critical is looking at each contract you're entering into and determining what are you getting paid for? because it's, it's on balance. So essentially is more than 75% or more than 50% of that contract paying you for the result. If the article isn't what they want, are you responsible in your own time for fixing it? Those kind of things. What are you actually delivering? What are you getting paid for? Or are you a photographer who is getting paid to essentially be there for two hours and you're getting paid for your time, not the result? So the advice I would have is to get a contract set up originally, because obviously you'd have you know, a template contract that you use for your freelancing, or I'd expect most of you did. Just make sure that that is worded in the, in the best possible way to give you the best possible argument to say that you are carrying on a personal services business. And therefore, if you do have a company, you're taxed in the company. Or if you are carrying on a sole trader business, you're not getting, there's some limitation on deductions if you are a personal services business. So you don't have to worry about those things if you are carrying on a personal services business and it all comes down to what are you getting paid for? Okay, that sounds complicated. <laughs> but it, maybe, is. Yeah. it is a bit, and I think, um, again, it's, it's much easier to fix 
prospectively, it's much harder to go back and go, oh, my contract didn't look very good. It said I was gonna pay it for two days work to sit at their office and write a story. That's not great. My contract said, I had one week to provide them with a story. That's much better. So we just got to make sure that the wording of what you're engaged for is really as, as helpful as possible to make sure that you legitimately tick all the boxes and have um, a very clear case to say that you're not carrying on a personal services. Sorry, it's not personal services income. You're carrying on a business. Okay. And so the, why, why do we care? Why does the tax office care whether it's personal services? Does that just mean that I get to claim more things if it's a business than if I am being um, an hourly rate kind of contractor? What's the difference? Good question. So there's a few differences. Let's, let's take the example where you I have a company. So companies generally taxed if it's an active business at 26% at the moment, whereas individuals are taxed at 47%. So let's say that you've got at the highest rate, depending on what you earn. So it goes from 30% broadly to 47%. So let's say that if you have a company and you wanted to be taxed at 26% on all your income, but really it was an individual doing all the work, the ATO's view is, well, really that should be taxed for the individual at 30% or higher. So you're getting an advantage by using the company. So okay. what the ATO does is looks through that and essentially says, well, you may pretend it's a company carrying on a business, but it's really you doing all the work. And therefore, we're going to tax you individually at a higher rate. And the limitations on deductions are things like you can't claim rents and mortgages. You can't claim um, paying someone for administrative work. You can't pay uh, claim superannuation contributions for associates. And there's a few limitations if you don't tick the box for carrying on a personal services business. And instead, it's contributed to your income. Similarly, if you're a sole trader, it still has an impact. It's not as much because you're still gonna be taxed yourself, but there are some differences. You can only claim one car as a deduction and a few other things. And it's a little bit more limited if you don't satisfy the ATO that you're carrying on a business. Oh, wow. Okay, well, there's a lot to think about there, Kajri. And I think it's, it does sound like um, there's, there's just, uh, getting advice sounds like a really, really important thing to do when you first set up, but not just when you first set up, when you're continuing uh, along your business journey. And I might, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, as, as time ticks along, I'm going to move over to, to Nina now. Um, I know, Kadri, um, you have kindly offered to keep an eye on the questions and we will have uh, a few more from the audience in uh, a little while. I can already see a number of them coming in. Um, but I'm going to move to Nina now. Now, Nina, like me, you've been a freelancer for all of your journalism career. And um, I've got to say, the journalism landscape for freelancers is quite different to what it was um, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, there's certainly a lot more services and a lot more information around than um, that's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. But yeah, there certainly is a lot, lot more around. Um, so, so if you, Nina, if you were talking to yourself, you, you were doing the, um, the fly back in time thing, what would you say to younger you about, um, about the mistakes to avoid when you first start out? Yeah, um, well, firstly, I just want to also say that I'm joining from Dark and Doom land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, and I also want to confess that when I was asked to be on this panel, my first inclination was to say that I should be in the audience because I've been notoriously bad at managing my finances to the point where I've recently just had to pay a massive tax bill and have also just caught up on all of my invoicing going back to 2017. Um, so I'm certainly more, I think, of an example of what not to do. And what I have learnt, um, I think the first thing that I learnt early on was if you don't put a price and a value on your work, no one else will. And for many years I worked essentially unpaid. I was doing a PhD and I, you get, you know, your $26,000, $27,000 from government. And on the side, I was writing a weekly article getting published and I thought I was, you know, building a portfolio and that was the right thing to do and I wasn't getting paid. And it's the first question that I always ask um, younger journalists and freelancers or younger freelancers now um, and students in particular is, did you get paid for that? And um, often they will say no. And, and the, the other thing that I learned was if you don't ask, you won't get offered. So if you don't ask to be paid, um, very rarely will people voluntarily um, cough up the money. So um, I guess that's the first thing is that placing an expectation on that. Um, and... Uh, some, I mean, some of the things that I've taught younger journalists is things like just saying to an editor, um, where do I send my, my invoice and how much should I make that invoice out for? Assume that you should get paid for your work rather than the other way around. Um, the other thing I was really notoriously bad at and still am um, is 
having a system and record keeping around that. And it's taken me quite a while um, to sort that out. So I think I'm sort of more of a cautionary tale in that regard. The things that I think, um, I guess I have done well um, in my career would be um, for like, and I guess this is really for people starting out, is I specialised very early on in um, what I write about. I primarily write about sexual violence in Australia and it's niche, um, it's what I'm passionate about, but because of that, I've had a lot more opportunities um, and doors open, which can then become more lucrative and financially stabilising. Um, and I think the other thing that I've always tried to do is work with other journalists whenever possible and to collaborate on projects and through that learning um, about others' processes and so on. But also within that, finding out what is normal, what like what should you be paid for work? And I know um, Mia has their compare rates, which you can go and look at what different freelancers get paid, um, but also just developing a network of other journalists who you're working with and finding out um, and I, I'll never forget a few years back I worked on this major investigation which I was selling to a network television state um, a network television um, and uh, when I went to deliver it or when we were negotiating about it they asked me what I wanted to be paid and I said it and they voluntarily said that they would double it and I realized how much I'd been undervaluing what what I was delivering so I guess that's um, yeah. They're just a few few tips of um, yeah, think easy mistakes to make. That's those are great. I think that's so important too. I know that um, I remember working with another or talking to another freelancer at one stage and and getting um, su surprised look from an employee journalist who said, "Oh, aren't you all again like competing?" With each other, and I was like, "No, God, no! Other other freelance journalists are my allies. Yeah. You know, we share work around. You never open a newspaper, or well, you never not open a newspaper anymore. But you never go to a news site and see the same byline all the time. You know, and um, yeah. So, so I think that's a, such a great tip is to collaborate with others, and um, also when you're working together, you know, you can you can all start to agree on on what a rate should be, and and that whole idea of a rising tide lifting all boats, you know, everyone everyone benefits when we all start for, to expect um, to be paid uh, according to our value. Um, yeah, well, yeah, and I'm very honest, with, like when younger, in particular younger journalists contact me um, and ask me what I get paid for at different places, I'll just tell, I'll tell them straight away because, oh, yeah. it, you know, and I wish I'd known earlier what to expect. Oh. Absolutely. Look, there's a lot of really great freelance groups around too. Um, there's there's Freeline, which is uh, a, a kind of a, a Google email group that I'm a part of. There's the Freelance Jungle. There's the uh, Australian Writers Groups, and um, the MEAA have got a freelancers website. Um, uh, Marcus can probably pop the, uh, the the link in the chat. And there's there's just so many networking groups around, and people are so willing to share information. I found in the freelance community, so that I think that's such a great tip. And then the kind of work you do, though, it's really it's pretty full on. Like it's you know you cover really sensitive, time consuming stories, but they're also very legally fraught. So how do you? I mean, there's a financial kind of impact with that. Um, how do you protect yourself from, from potential legal action? Yeah, okay. Um, so I guess I've got, I've just written a couple of notes. Um, I think the first thing for any freelancer um, working with any organisation is to find out if you're indemnified um, and what you're indemnified for. So things like your Twitter accounts and so on, you're almost certainly not indemnified for anything like that. So even, and there'll be times when I've done a story and I won't share my own stories because I'm not indemnified to, um, to share it on my own social media. Um, I remember a couple of years back, I did a story for New Matilda, which is an independent organisation uh, uh, publishing, and no one else would publish the story. And the story was about a um, criminal barrister in Sydney, um, who Charles Water Street, who was alleged to have sexually harassed young women. And so obviously when you're accusing a highly prominent individual of that, um, it was not uh, the other organised networks and so on wouldn't touch it and New Matilda couldn't indemnify me. And that was one of those ones where it was extremely um, hairy to, to proceed. And we did, we published. And when we published, um, I had to do so knowing that it was my house on the line if we mm -hmm. were sued. Um, and we went in with the attitude of not would we not would we get sued, we assumed we would get sued, but would we win? 
Um, and that was the attitude. That, and in order to get the investigation to that point where we felt confident that not only if we did get like that we would win if we got sued, um, all of the victim uh, survivors had to do sign affidavits. There was a rigorous process and we did that in direct consultation with a law firm, Mark Law Firm. So that was one of the things that we had to do to get that to that point. Um, another, just a few other tips that I can give um, that have helped me a lot in my career is to um, whenever you, so, say you're in, um, online or print, um, whenever you send a story in and pay attention to any changes that are made in the final product that have been made by lawyers because and learn from that, learn from things which get changed. Um, I, with news.com.au, have ended up um, corresponding directly with the lawyers as much as with my own editor. And that's been extremely valuable because then I'm learning directly from the lawyers themselves rather than the editor taking my work to the lawyer and having them legal it. Um, so develop a relationship with the lawyers who are, who are going over your work. Um, Gina McWilliams in particular, like it was in a conversation with Gina when she was legaling one of my pieces that we just started talking about this crazy law in Tasmania that she was we were just chatting and she told me about this gag law in Tasmania and I'd never heard of anything like that. And that's ended up being the Let Her Speak campaign. Um, so there are other benefits. Uh, the other thing I've learned from is always attend, if you can, seminars on defamation, um, shield laws, freedom of information, GIPA, anything like that. Take advantage of those opportunities. And I was just going to mention on the shield law thing, um, join your union. <laughs> um, in 2017, I had the very unfortunate experience of I was reporting on a sexual assault case up in um, Queensland. And when the offender got out of jail, he tried to subpoena me for all of my, um, all of my contacts, etc. in what was a very complex case. And he was doing it through the family law court. Um, and when that happened, I would have had to hand over all of my, um, essentially, he, he'd sexually assaulted a student at um, James Cook University. He was a staff member. He went to jail for the crime. I'd published all about it and including the university covering it up. He wanted to subpoena me to find out who my sources were. And if I'd handed over my sources, I would have been handing over people working at that institution who had entrusted me with that, that um, detail. And in that, and they would have lost their jobs. And so there was no way I was going to hand over these sources. But in that process, I found out that in Queensland, they didn't have shield laws for journalists. And so I was extremely vulnerable and I was facing potential contempt of court, which would mean, um, you know, at its worst jail time or fines. Um, and so I called Mia and I was like, what do I do? And um, they were able to provide a lot of support in that process. Um, they are finally now, I think, getting shield laws in Queensland, but pay attention and learn about that stuff prior to, to publishing. Um, <laughs> and you know, lastly, there are law firms out there, like I mentioned Mark Lawyers before, um, who particularly if you're doing... Um, social justice type reporting, they will, they may actually work with you and provide additional support. So they've legal the entire Let Her Speak campaign. Um, they've done a lot of work in the Let Her Speak campaign, but they've also previously I did a campaign called uh, the Red Zone Report, where I was reporting on sexual violence and hazing with some of the most elite residential colleges attached to universities in the country. And what I didn't realise was when I was um, compiling a big investigation around that, was that um, I always knew that individuals could sue for defamation, but I didn't realise that so could charities. And a lot of the colleges are actually registered charities. And so they could have potentially sued me for that. And thankfully I had a very good team of defamation lawyers at Mark working pro bono for me on that whole investigation. Um, and we didn't get sued, but I, I remember finding out like eight days, I've been working on this investigation for months and it was eight days before we dropped that I found that out and like was it was a very stressful time I'll say that well so, yeah I mean there's huge financial implications as well as the the legal yeah so it sounds like being able to cover yourself with that is really important yeah and and knowing that you can get sued individually and I think it was a really um interesting point that Kadiri made about if somebody's really, really that upset, they, they won't necessarily just go for the deep pockets. They may also go for you individually um, because it's personal. And I think, you know, we've seen that recently with, um, you know, a case involving the ABC. Yeah. 
Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, look, this, the kind of serious investigative journalism that you're doing around really sensitive topics, I mean, this can take a really serious emotional toll as well as taking a lot of time and, and that fear of legal uh, implications. And, you know, if, I, if you were working in an organisation, you do have support you, as well as legal support. You've got emotional support. As a freelancer out on, on their own, how have you managed to, to get through that kind of stuff? Okay. Um, yeah, so I know some people will be familiar with the concept of vicarious trauma and others won't, but for anyone who's not vicarious trauma is essentially trauma that we can develop by being exposed to trauma. Um, and it's extremely common for journalists um, and not just journalists who are reporting um, on crime, but all kind, you know, people who are reporting on all kinds of issues, um, in, including um, you know, even car crashes and so on can be extremely traumatising to, to be speaking to people just after um, something's happened. For me, um, you know, we hear a lot about self-care, which people assume means having a cup of tea and doing yoga and so on. And yes, that can all be a part of it. And debriefing is a really important part of it. But um, having structures around that is also critical. So for me, some of the things, like I have... Um, like one of the things that sparks trauma is feeling loss of control over a situation. So one of the beauties of freelancing is that you actually do have the capacity to control quite a few things in your environment. And so grounding yourself by reminding yourself of what those are. So for me, I can control what stories I say yes to and what stories I won't do. And um, one of my rules to myself is that I won't report on any rape or murder which happens within a 50 kilometre radius of where I, I live. So like with the Let Her Speak campaign, I live in New South Wales and yet those campaigns have been run in Tasmania, Victoria and the Northern Territory. And that's actually been fantastic for my mental health because even though I'm reporting on really serious crime, I have that physical sense of removal. So geographically, I feel a lot safer. Um, I... Um, know, knowing the signs of burnout and knowing, um, like recognising those signs within yourself, whether that's um, intrusive thoughts or flashbacks or constantly being distracted and thinking about your work, um, nightmares, sleeplessness, um, or, or equally it could be, the, it could be paral paralysis rather than being, um, you know, highly aroused around the work, um, the workload. But yeah, I guess one thing that has also is really important is having those um, systems in place to de to debrief because when you, particularly if you're going from an office environment to a freelance freelancing and working from home and you're literally bringing trauma into your house like I'm sitting right here and just out there you can probably hear I've got my baby is just around the corner in the kitchen um, it's you know it, it really is that close to home um, so finding ways to separate I have some of those little rules for myself, but also being open about the fact that this stuff is hard. Like it's, it's not easy. And I'm quite open about the fact that I definitely, I definitely do carry vicarious trauma. I definitely have been traumatized and this stuff does impact me. And I don't want to sugarcoat it for others because I don't think that helps anyone to do that. I think it's okay to say, you know, I struggle and, um, and that's part of it. Yeah. So, there's, there's been lots of questions, so many questions. Um, one um, in particular, Kadri, about um, personal services income again. Um, if you have a contract where you're um, per word um, or per hour, is that more likely to make you personal services income, do you think? So the, the rule is you've got to look at it contract by contract. And so if yeah. you look at your contract and you say that more than 50% of what I'm being paid for is my personal exertion, then you're in personal services income as a starting point. So anything really that a journalist does as a starting point is going to be personal services income. So then the next thing is this results test we talked about. So are you getting paid for finished product? Are you um, responsible for providing the equipment you need to do? Do your writing. Are you responsible for rectifying something if something's wrong or something needs to be changed? And is it all on your own time? That is more likely then to go to that you are providing a result and therefore more likely to be that you would be able to be in business and not be directly attributed to you. So the per hour kind of makes it a little bit more difficult to justify that you've been paid for a result because you've been paid for your yeah. time. Whereas in particular, per word yeah. is a little bit help, yeah. more helpful, but even better is per article or you know per, per end, whatever it is that you're contracting for. When it's time-based, it's a lot more difficult to justify that you're being paid mm -hmm. for a result. 
because you're going to get okay, paid regardless that, of what you that, produce. So when you look at a freelancer's year, say, um, I mean, some people like I, I think there's been a few questions about different revenue streams um, and and about using you know um, different uh, income averaging, which is uh, a whole level of technicality, oh, which I, I might get you to to look at though, because I think it's an interesting one. Um, so if I'm a freelancer, I might have a bunch of different work I do. I might go and sub edit for a magazine in their house as a contractor one week. The next week I might be paid per word to produce a particular article. And then the next, the week after that, I might be pay, paid for three hours photography work. So all of these things, if I've got a diverse range of income, does that mean that I'm more likely, that it's all going to be treated as um, as not personal service or does the tax office look at individual 75%. things? 75%. So it asks you oh. to judge each of your contracts and then look at whether at least 75% of your contracts would satisfy Of each contract. So each person who pays you. Correct. And they look at then, so they say, you first you look at each contract and work out I've been paid for your personal exertion. Let's assume yes, because we should all, we would all be, I would expect. And then you say, well, now look at, can you pass the results test for each of the contracts? And to be a personal services business, at least 75% of your income needs to be for results. If it's less than that, then there are some alternative tests you can look at. So then you need to look at do you have unrelated clients, do you maintain business premises, do you hire people? And there's kind of tests that go on and on and on and on, essentially. <laughs> but the, okay. is, the, the easiest one generally to pass because it's more a contractual based thing is the results test because it's kind of what are you getting paid for? And that's something you generally have a bit more control over at the start of when you're setting up. So that's what we try to emphasize with the kind of the professionals we work with that just think about what you're contracting for and what you're getting paid for. But of course, appreciating there'll be, you know, diversity in your contracts and there will be times when you are absolutely paid for your personal exertion for hours, but it's just maintaining the balance and it's 75% is the rule. Okay. So these kinds of things, I mean, it gets complicated. I don't know if you're still there, Karen. Um, and and I, I, I guess one of the questions um, uh, that someone came up with was about Henry, whether you're able to, I know that you do give some tax advice and you certainly lodge people's tax returns. I mean, how can somebody use Henry and still um, get advice on these kinds of really complicated things around contracts and, uh, and payments? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, part of the service, which is part of the uniqueness of it, is you can set uh, unlimited consultations up with one of our tax specialists. Um, what we find is there is a natural limiter in that and people only want to talk to their tax accountants so many times. Um, <laughs> But that's all included as part of the service. Okay. All right. Well, that's 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 pretty cool. Okay. Now there has been a very difficult question here, which is something that I'm I don't know if this is uh, outside the scope, but income averaging. Okay. So when we talk about people who are creative freelancers, they might get a whole lot of money one year. So you might you might write a best selling novel, which in Australia should make you at least ten thousand dollars, and then the year after that, you might be working on your next novel and get nothing. So how can you, how does income averaging work? Can you explain that, Kadri, and, and whether, what the test is for that? Um, I can try, but to be honest, I'm not that close to it because I haven't looked at it recently. But what it tries okay. to do is special professionals and um, authors are included, so journalists would be included. So any author of a literary work is included. Um, and you are allowed to essentially smooth out over a period of five years any I can't remember the words, but extraordinary income. So let's say, for example, from your freelancing activities, on average, you earn 20 grand a year, but in one year, you earn 100 grand. What you get to do is take that 80, which is kind of extraordinary above average income, and smooth out the tax on that over a number of years. I think you include one fifth each year for a number of years. And you don't work out the tax, you just put the income amounts in the tax return, particular labels, and then the ATO works out how much the tax is. But what it allows you to do is smooth your tax bill rather than paying on that extraordinary year all at once, which would be a huge hit and put you in a higher tax bracket. It actually smooths it out over a period of time. But sorry, that's as specific as I can be. I'm sorry, because I haven't- yeah, that's fine. A long time. <laughs> Apologies. I think, yeah, I think when it gets any, any more complicated, uh, we all, everyone's eyes start glazing over. And please see, oh, okay, a, this please is see your tax advisor. Go and talk to Karen. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Okay. Um, look, I, we've, we've got loads more questions, but I, there's a, one in particular um, that I thought, thank you, Bernadette, for this question. If you're in your mid-50s, limited and sporadic income, and you've had to d dip into your super to survive 2020, I'm sure that there are uh, Quite a few people on this on this uh, call um, who've who've experienced that situation. 
what's the how do you get back from this and this could be country or, or john i see your back online john sorry i just saw your note there um so if one of you can advise it, it sometimes you don't have much choice but to dip into your super and we've certainly had that opportunity um this year well opportunity thank you um uh, yeah so any advice on on getting back from that my general principle and so i'm, I'm technically self-employed as well because so i'm a partner in a partnership and so for me until recently i wasn't actually worried about my superannuation and then i turned 40 and then oh my god i've had a big life crisis and then went, oh my god i need to start putting money in i think if you've taken money out absolutely that's wonderful that we were given the you know opportunity to do that but it is the most tax efficient thing and it is worth to try and build that up a little bit because what you put in there becomes, and I'm talking a bit out of school, but John will be able to advise, but you're essentially going to get it out tax-free once you turn 65 depend, um, or around there, depending on when you were born. So there are a lot of, if possible, trying to build your balance up again, particularly if you're in your 50s and you're going to be able to take it out tax-free in 10 years or draw a tax-free pension is a really, really smart thing to do. But obviously paying off a mortgage and all that kind of thing is also very valuable. So it just comes down so much to your personal circumstances. But at the moment, because mortgage rates are so low, a lot of our clients are choosing to take the opportunity to put more money into super and realize the tax savings instead. John, have you got anything to add to that? My apologies. I think um I think the kids being at home have been sucking all the juice from the internet and I'm <laughs> ducking in and out. So my apologies. Um, I, I didn't catch all of the response, but I heard the question. Look, look, it's, it's a real challenge. Um, and unfortunately, we've seen a, a, a large number of people um, throughout the economy have to dip into superannuation. And look, there's just, there's just no easy answer to it. Um, super is a... Um, tax incentivized way of saving. And the reality is it's, it's a function of how much time you have, um, how much money you put in, how you can best decide how to put that money in. So before after tax uh, and, and investment risk and, and slash return. Um, plus there's other bits and pieces in terms of fees, uh, insurance and so forth. There's, there's no easy answer. Um, you know, and it's not just COVID, um, you know, for particularly for women. Um, and also if women have been working overseas for a period of time where they haven't been earning super, um, there's a gap uh, in those circumstances. And without um, legislation to, uh, to assist in some way, shape or form, the reality is you can just put more in the best way you possibly can. Um, start as early as you possibly can. Um, you, you can consider in investments and the returns and where it's invested. However, that does come with a risk um, and that's the reality of it. Um, more about being consistent and trying to set up consistent patterns um, so that it becomes a natural habit so that you don't think about the super. Because the reality is when you're an employee, um, it's not actually your money. Um, that's being paid is actually the employer's money that's being paid into your account. The moment it gets into your super, it's your money, but it's actually their expense. Um, when you're self-employed, you are for all intensive purposes, well, not technically, but you're employing yourself. Um, and, and that's the trick. And because it's not compulsory for sole operating sole proprietors, they're the people that tend to be, because it's not enforced, they're the people that tend to be further behind. So if you throw in the fact that you're a freelancer, um, if you throw in the fact that the gig economy is changing, you mentioned the disruption to the economy, certainly occurred all through journalism, the world of media. Um, it's happening all through creative arts in all sorts of ways in terms of disruption. Um, the gig economy coming, people being moved to more dysfunctional and um, irregular forms of employment it's it's not easy um but the only no. thing you can do really is that and get help so that you know what the options are um so that you're not paying for something you don't want um you know you can reduce costs in certain ways um that you're invested in something you're comfortable with understand what that means um most people are in in, in 
in uh, industry funds and in um, most retail funds. Most people are, are in the default fund, which is a balanced fund, which has moderate to aggressive risk. In other words, you know, that, that's, there's like 60 to 70% in growth assets versus 30 to 40% in defensive assets. Most people don't know what that means. It's just, it's just a matter of trying to educate yourself as much as possible, um, being disciplined, but just going, hey, you know, can I, can I get help? Is there anyone out there? Um, that's what my team does. They help people. They try and go, yeah, yeah, cool. We'll, we'll talk you through it. Um, and the more creative you are or the more you focus on the word, versus the quest for X, and it is a generalization, um, the less inclined some people are towards that financial side. And they're the people that generally actually need more help. So you just need someone that can hold a hand, take you through the questions, give you as, as much guidance as they possibly can, and send you off in the direction to find the information and, and just talk about it. Okay. I, oh, I, look, that, that's, I mean, that's... Plan. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it isn't... It isn't one size fits all at all, um, which is which is fair enough. So it's good to know that you can always pick up the phone and um, and and find out a bit more about your own personal situation. Um, I might to see if uh, if Nina's still available um, because Nina, you've gone through this whole um, you know trying to to sort out your super kind of thing, and we were talking um, before about how um, it would have been great to have a service that that did that for you. What what was the thing that you found the most useful when you decided to get your super sorted? Oh, um, it was to be, I, it, I mean, it shows how chaotic things have been. It was that I just sat down and caught up on a whole lot of um, invoicing and quite a lot of money came in and I just decided to chuck it all in my super and catch up on my super that way. So, yep. um, um, and just as we were listening, then I've just been looking on, online at where I should be at my age and I'm there. But, um, but yeah, that's, it, it was catching up really yeah and just well, I, I guess that's it what what did it was a prioritization and the decision that that's an investment that I wanted to make I think that that's a great tip actually that because every now and then as a freelancer you'll get the um oh my god I can buy a new computer and a holiday um payment from someone who hasn't paid you for six months and it all comes through at once so um having that discipline which you've had to, to Nina to to be able to go oh oh maybe I won't take it all to the lolly shop I'll actually start and to, to do something adult with it um that that's great um current do you does Henry um apply um does Henry do super calculations as well as tax yeah so uh part of the um features of the service so we have an allocations module in the app where you can allocate an amount of money that comes out of each your self-employed um, payment that's made to you to whatever you want. So people use it to deposit into savings accounts. They may pay it to another bank account, perhaps a family member. But most of our most of our customers will use it to make an allocation to superannuation. Um, and that's a really good way to stay disciplined around long-term investment as well. Um, and then you know, the, the tax calculations come into account when we um, lodge your return at the end of the year around that as well. Okay, that's that sounds like something I should have done twenty years ago. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, where, yeah. where were you? <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think that's just just I mean, Fran, just on that point, I think one of the principal things that we exist for is ensuring the financial wellness of our customers. And I think Nina, some of the stories you shared really resonated with some of the stories we hear every day from our customers as well. And central to the financial wellness is about ensuring you're saving for your retirement. And I know sole traders are notoriously poor at doing this. And so to the extent that we can support with that, we do everything that we can. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. I, I just wanted to, um, I think we're, well, there are lots and lots more questions that we didn't get to. Um, there's a couple of things I just wanted to highlight. Um, we haven't really covered insurance because we, I mean, I thought we were going to, we, we were going to, um, run out of things to talk about but we haven't um, and we certainly haven't looked at insurance that's something that is part of the MEAA freelance pro category so if anyone's looking at um, at insurance which you probably should do if you're if you're working in journalism or photography or anything where you might get uh, potentially uh, have some indemnity issues do have a look at the MEAA freelance pro membership because you can actually um, save um, you know, your union fees are almost free, pretty much free, and it's cheaper than you would normally pay for insurance, and you get insurance and um, and MEAA membership. I'm, I'm, 
I am on the federal council. I'm, I'm not, I don't get a commission for getting people to join, but I, I really do think that's a, one of the more sensible things you can do. Um, and I just wanted to say a huge thank you um, to um, to everyone who's uh, who's joined us tonight. Thank you so much, Nina Fennell, for your um, amazing work, um, which which I've been long long been an admirer of, but also in, um, sharing all all the, the the hard work of being a freelancer with everyone so honestly. And thank you so much, Kadri, for your amazing advice, Karen. It's it's really exciting to hear about Henry, and I'd love to hear more about it. And um, John Myers and Media Super, amazing, um, amazing. Thank you so much for your wonderful advice and also for all, all that you do for the industry. And a big thank you, of course, to the Walkley Foundation for, um, for sponsoring this, this series. Um, I've seen some absolutely fantastic um, uh, people, names I know very well in the freelance community and lots of, lots of people I haven't seen before. So it's, it's been really great to see you all here. Thank you so much for joining us and I hope you um, have a great evening for the rest of the evening. I think we've got the, the speed wall climbing, which is apparently an Olympic event. So I'm gonna go and check that out soon. <laughs> um, hope you all have a good evening. Thanks so much. Bye for now. <laughs>